you very much, Bruno, and I'd like to thank Richard for the invitation. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I won't actually, I, unfortunately, I won't actually be talking about Dante. <laughs> I, I, I should have thought that that would have been appropriate, but instead, um, what I'm giving you is the first, um, a first stab at uh, an attempt to extract one element from the book um, and, and push it in a, in a very forceful way, which is um, to read Marx as a proponent of the um, Republican conception of freedom as non-domination. So um, that's what I'll be doing today. Um, so according to some interpreters, Marx is critically deflationary regarding the notion of freedom, regarding it as one of the sham ideals of bourgeois society, or as an ideological reflex of the market. According to a famous passage from chapter six of Capital, the sphere of circulation or commodity exchange is the exclusive realm of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. Close quote. Uh, those who see Marx as a critic of freedom will point out that Marx wants to lead us beyond and beneath this realm of exchange, where everything takes place on the surface, and where buyer and seller are determined only by their own free will. Once we enter the hidden abode of production, as Marx argues we must, we discover that the notion of people as free persons who are equal before the law um, is just a cover for the subordination of workers compelled by their lack of property and the means of production to capitalist bosses who control those means of production and use their control to exploit the labor of the workers. Freedom is, on this reading, an ideological notion that obscures and naturalizes the capitalist power over and exploitation of the workers. Or, as Marx and Engels put it in the manifesto, freedom under present bourgeois conditions of produc production means only free trade, free selling and buying. But if selling and buying disappears, free selling and buying disappears also. This talk about free selling and buying and all of the other brave words of our bourgeois about freedom in general have no meaning when opposed to the communistic abolition of buying and selling of the bourgeois conditions of production and of the bourgeoisie itself. This reading's not very credible, though. Um, it doesn't attract much scholarly support. Um, in the first place, and despite the texts I've just cited, there are numerous places where Marx defends one freedom or another, or looks forward to the freedom people will experience under socialism or communism. In short, his polemical assaults on free buying and selling should not be inflated into a critique of freedom to court. Moreover, <clears throat> Marx's deflationary criticisms of bourgeois freedom themselves seem to entail a contrast with real freedom. If Marx attacks the notion that the market is populated by free persons who are equal before the law, it is because the freedom of the market presupposes and entrenches the unfreedom of workers. In other words, Marx is criticizing an obvious and superficial sort of freedom for obscuring and legitimizing a deeper and more far-reaching unfreedom. Hence, the very terms of the criticism imply that we ought to pursue a more substantial freedom than the freedom of the market. <clears throat> the dominant approach, therefore, is to claim that Marx is both an advocate and a theorist of freedom, but that his understanding of freedom is radically divergent from the traditional liberal notion of freedom from coercive constraint. Thus, according to Andres Wojcicki, the whole, quote, uh, the whole Marxian philosophy of history and man, as well as his vision of the communist society of the future, revolves around the problem of freedom. And Marx's response to this problem, quote, has nothing in common with negative liberty. Among those who emphasize the role of freedom in Marx's political and theoretical projects, there is a near consensus around Felicki's position that Marx has a positive conception of freedom. <clears throat> However, there is quite a bit of disagreement and even confusion about the precise outlines of this conception. Alan Wood attributes to Marx the claim that freedom consists in, quote, the subjection of oneself and its essential functions to one's own conscious, rational choice, close quote. Where those functions include, quote, the social conditions of human production and all social relations as such. George Brankert claims that Marx understands being free as, quote, essentially determining within communal relations to other people, the concrete totality of desires, capacities, and talents which constitute one's self-objectification, close quote. In a more popular vein, Terry Eagleton claims that, quote, what Marx knows as freedom is self-determination or the ability of people to, quote, shape a narrative for themselves. Falicki himself took the position that freedom, quote, freedom was conceived by Marx not as an absence of external co coercion or constraint, 
but as the ability to live in accordance with man's essential nature, that is, as the opposite of dehumanization. My thesis in this paper <clears throat> is that these efforts to elaborate upon Marx's conception of positive freedom are largely misguided, and that they distract us from a much more fruitful project, sussing out the precise contours and implications of Marx's conception of negative freedom. Despite the novelty and inherent interest of Marx's various comments about self-realization and self-determination, they are not, in the final analysis, very important for understanding either his critique of capitalism or his political strategies for the self-emancipation of the laboring class. These hinge instead upon Marx's commitment to freedom from domination, where domination means being subject to another's power, where that power is one you cannot control. Marx's major contributions to political theory stem from his attempt to work out this con commitment to freedom as non-domination through a critical analysis of the dynamics of modern commercial economy on the one hand and a political strategy of bottom-up popular mobilization on the other. So my itinerary is going to be as follows. <clears throat> I will first differentiate two broad strands of the positive liberty reading of Marx. According to one, Marxian freedom is a form of human self-realization, the universal development of specifically human capacities in an open-ended way. According to another reading, Marxian freedom is a form of collective self-determination or rational control over the social and natural conditions of human life. I will grant that both of these notions of positive freedom can properly be attributed to Marx. However, by examining some of the representative key texts in the next section, then I hope to show how to think about the relationship between these two positive conceptions such that, on one hand, self-determination takes a certain lexical priority over self-realization, and second, self-realization is explicitly located by Marx beyond politics, thereby obviating the great that great liberal bugbear that one might be forced to be free. After this, turning then to freedom as self-determination, <clears throat> I will identify three candidate conceptions in Marx's texts that of individual, ed individual independence, that of democratic self-rule, and that of collective rational control. I hope to show that the first two notions are ruled out by Marx as fruitful conceptions of self-determination, and finally, that Marx's invocations of collective rational control are compatible with, indeed presuppose, the attainment of freedom from domination. Then finally, I'm going to conclude very briefly by considering some independent reasons for pursuing this Republican reading of Marx and some likely consequences thereof. Throughout, I'm going to focus on examples culled from Marx's texts of the 1850s and after. It's my contention that the Marx of Capital and the International Working Men's Association is committed to a politics of Republican freedom, so invocations of positive liberty from Marx's later texts are the harder cases for my argument. Um, I, I, there's going to be several large block quotes in this, uh, and I, if I'd been thinking ahead, I would have printed them out or put them on the PowerPoint slide or something like that, but uh, I apologize I didn't do that, so I'll just I'll read some large blocks of text. Um, hopefully that'll be okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start uh, with Marx's criticism of Adam Smith in the Grundrisse, uh, which gives rise to some comments about freedom that I think are representative of a broad current of Marx's thinking. This is the first block quote. In the sweat of thy brow shall thou labor, was Jehovah's curse on Adam. And this labor for Smith is a cur and this is labor for Smith, a curse. Tranquility appears as the adequate state, as identical with freedom and happiness. It seems quite far from Smith's mind that the individual, in his normal state of health, strength, activity, skill, facility, also needs a normal portion of work and of the suspension of tranquility. Certainly, labor obtains its measure from the outside though through the aim to be attained and the obstacles to be overcome in attaining it. But Smith has no inkling whatsoever that this overcoming of obstacles is itself a liberating activity and that further, the external aims become stripped of their semblance of merely external natural urgencies and become posited as aims which the individual himself posits, hence as self-realization, objectification of the subject, hence real freedom whose action is precisely labor. This is admittedly only an aside, but I have no doubt that it's Marx's genuine and considered view. Precisely the offhand nature of the comment seems to me to indicate that this identification of real freedom with self-objectification through labor is obvious and intuitive to Marx. It's also something he considered carefully earlier in his life. Um, 
his writings of 1843 to 1846 worked out this view quite extensively, even if they did so always polemically in opposition to the idealistic valorization of free thinking that Marx saw in his young Hegelian former colleagues. Therefore, I have no interest in denying either the authenticity or the seriousness of Marx's commitment to this notion of freedom. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I do want to argue that this notion of real freedom plays a very precise and circumscribed role in Marx's thought. Basically, it plays the same role that the account of eudaimonia and virtuous action plays in Aristotle. On the one hand, it provides Marx with an account of human well-being or happiness or perfection. This is an ethical ideal of individual human self-development and self-actualization, or the unfolding and exercise of human potentialities as an end in itself. But it also provides a vision of perfect human community, a community in which the slogan, from each according to their abilities and to each according to their needs, would be the rule. Far more important than the virtues or shortcomings, I, well, I should say, like, I think Marx and Aristotle would, they would disagree about the precise character of eudaimonia, and they would have arguments with one another about what sorts of activities are, can be ends in themselves, what sorts of things um, are part and parcel of a happy life, but those would be arguments among people who share a framework of eudaimonism. Um, and I think far more important than the virtues or shortcomings of Marx's particular brand of eudaimonism is the profoundly limited role that it plays in his mature critique of political economy and his political writings. Its role is limited both empirically, in the sense that it doesn't show up very often in Marx's later writings, and conceptually. I think, moreover, um, that the conceptual limits of eudaimonism go some way, some distance toward explaining the peripheral existence of real freedom and full human development, or similar phrases in Marx's work from the 1860s and 1870s. Rather than being a missing or suppressed lodestone of Marx's mature thinking, as many of Marx's more humanistic and romantic readers suppose, I will argue that Marx's vision of human self-development is pushed aside by his concern with the social barriers to human flourishing on the one hand and the political movement to overcome these barriers on the other. As an index of its rarity in Marx's later works, the prospect of full human development only shows up twice in volume one of Capital. Both appearances are in chapter 15, and both are noteworthy, so I'm going to read both of them. <clears throat> First, Marx writes, uh, the ancient Greeks perhaps excused the slavery of one as the means to the full human development of another, but to preach slavery for the masses in order that a few rough, half-educated parvenus might become eminent spinners, extensive sausage makers, and influential shoe black dealers. For this, they lacked the specifically Christian faculty. Second, a little later in the chapter, um, with the ever-increasing preponderance of the urban population, which it brings together in the great centers, capitalist production, on the one hand, concentrates the historical motive power of society. On the other hand, it also disturbs the metabolism between human and earth i.e. the return of the soil to the soil of its elements consumed by humans in the form of food and clothing. It thereby disturbs the eternal natural conditions of the soil's fertility. It destroys at the same time the physical health of the urban laborer and the intellectual life of the rural laborer. But by destroying the merely spontaneous natural conditions for the maintenance of that metabolism, it compels its systematic restoration as a regulating law of social production, and under a form adequate to full human development. In agriculture, as in manufacture, the capitalist transformation of the production process also appears as the martyrology of the producers. The means of labor appears as the means of enslaving, exploiting, and impoverishing the labor. The social combination of labor processes appears as an organized suppression of the laborer's individual vitality, freedom, and independence. Okay. So the first thing I want to observe about these two passages is that in both, full human development is quite a long way off. In the first passage, Marx locates it in the ancient past. In the second, he holds, out, holds it out as a possibility for the post-capitalist future. In the past, full human development was the province of a few. In the future, he suggests it will be open to all. In the present, however, <clears throat> it seems to not be much of an option for anyone. This is the point of that crack about rough, half-educated parvenus. 
even the ruling classes in the modern world do not live the sort of all-around life that a eudaimonist valorizes. I'll return to this in a moment. But for now, let's ask what significance there might be to this distance between us and full human development. The real freedom that Marx locates in self-realization has a circumscribed role in Marx's critical and political writings precisely because it's something beautiful and perfect and to be hoped for. Real freedom is not actionable in the world as it is. Marx is a critical and politically engaged theorist because he believes that only a long political process can give the world an adequate form for general human self-realization. In history hitherto, real freedom and full human development have only, as Marx points out, served as a justification for the enslavement of a mass of people. Up till now, that development of human energy, which is an end in itself, has only been open to some insofar as others have been kept in bondage of one form or another. We need a transformation of the process of production, according to Marx, if we are to generate the prerequisites for opening this door to all. So what are these prerequisites? <clears throat> the usual account foregrounds technically advanced industrial production for one of two reasons. In one version, technology undergirds freedom, real freedom, because it embodies rational insight into and control over natural processes. We we'll call this the Promethean account of freedom. According to the Promethean reading of Marx, the realm of freedom emerges from advanced industrial production insofar as science and technology allow people to know what they are doing and thereby to control the effects of their own actions and to find joy and self-recognition in the results. In another version, though, technology undergirds freedom because it enables plentiful goods together with plentiful leisure. We can call this the Aristotelian account of freedom. According to the Aristotelian reading of Marx, the realm of freedom emerges from advanced industrial production insofar as science and technology allow everyone's material needs to, needs to be met without compelling and exploiting the labor of one class while simultaneously generalizing leisure time. I think the Promethean reading doesn't really accord very well with the later texts where Marx evoke, in, invokes full human development. These texts more naturally lend themselves to this more Aristotelian reading. In his, ancient, in his discussion of ancient freedom, for instance, Marx is making the point that there's something monstrous about the modern paradox, according to which machinery, the most powerful instrument for reducing labor time, becomes instead the most unfailing means of turning the whole lifetime of the worker and his family into labor time at capital's disposal. Mechanized industry ought to produce a surfeit of goods with a minimum of labor, thereby generalizing the conditions of freedom and full human development. Real freedom and real human development take place in free time, he seems to be saying. I think this conclusion is bolstered by a famous passage from Volume 3 of Capital, probably the most famous passage from Volume 3 of Capital. Another long block quote. Um, in fact, Marx writes, the realm of freedom actually only begins where labor which is determined by necessity and mundane consideration ceases. Thus, in the very nature of things, it lies beyond the sphere of actual material production. Just as the savage must wrestle with nature to satisfy his wants, to maintain and reproduce life, so must civilized man, and he must do so in all social formations and under all possible modes of production. With his development, this realm of physical necessity expands as a result of his wants, but at the same time, the forces of production, which satisfy those wants, also increase. Freedom in this field can only consist in socialized man, the associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control, instead of being ruled by it as by blind forces of nature, and achieving this with the least expenditure of energy and under conditions most favorable to and worthy of their human nature. But it nonetheless still remains a realm of necessity. Beyond this begins that development of human energy which is an end in itself, the true realm of freedom, which, however, can blossom forth only with this realm of necessity as its basis. The shortening of the working day is its basic prerequisite. Okay. So this text seems to establish two things. First, <clears throat> real freedom as human self-realization ought to be interpreted in this more Aristotelian fashion as human activity free from the demands of material necessity. However, this freedom from necessity requires a second freedom as its foundation, a freedom in necessity which more closely accords with the Promethean reading of Marx. 
Thus, second, a lexical priority is established. The freedom to control the effects of material production is for the sake of the freedom to develop one's human capacities fully and for their own sake, and therefore must be satisfied first, where satisfied means established to the point where real freedom is a general possibility. However, this conclusion is not all that can be said about the prerequisites of real freedom. Freedom from the necessity of laboring to live is one of the prerequisites of Marx's true realm of freedom, but it's not the only one. In order that I can develop my activity as an end in itself, certain social and political barriers to this freedom must be removed. We know that Marx wanted the working class to use political power to emancipate itself. <clears throat> this was the leitmotif of his entire involvement with the International Workingmen's Association. So we can ask, therefore, what barriers to freedom, to real freedom in this Aristotelian sense, might be dismantled by political power? Political power means something specific for Marx. Um, political power, properly so called, he claimed in the manifesto, is merely the organized power of one class for suppressing another. <clears throat> this organized power scares people. I mean, that's how it's supposed to work, right? Uh, it promulgates rules and threatens punishment for those who break the rules. Because this is how political power works, it's not omnicompetent. There are many projects that political power is ill-suited to pursue. Political power does a terrible job of developing the forces of production, for instance, or of advancing science or scholarship. This point is central to Marx's opposition to all of those socialists, um, from Proudhon to During and beyond, who saw capitalism as reducible to the political power of the capitalists. Um, this is uh, important because uh, What's distinct about capitalism is this rapid development of the forces of production. If capitalism was just the political power of capitalists, that wouldn't be true. There wouldn't be this dy dynamism. Um, <clears throat> therefore, we cannot expect that political power, regardless of who is utilizing it, will help acquire the technological prerequisites of real freedom. And this is contrary to what uh, Engels um, thought in some of his later writings, um, where he claims that the social republic would be utterly incapable, or sorry, he thinks that it would be capable of promoting an unbroken, constantly accelerated development of the productive forces, and therewith a practically unlimited increase of production itself. And I think on the basis of Marx's argument, we should be skeptical of that. You can't scare people into collective self-mastery. Um, even less can you scare people into that development of human energy, which is an end in itself. But that's what political power does. Right? So political power um, can't do that. But it might credibly be able to remove other barriers to freedom. One thing that political power can do is protect people from certain sorts of interference. It can protect people either a, by prohibiting policing and punishing certain types of interference, or B, by insuring people against certain losses, right? transferring to them or otherwise guaranteeing them the resources to escape or weather particular storms. Right? So for instance, the state can prohibit police and punish theft, thereby protecting people from those with the power to expropriate them. Alternatively, it can indemnify people, guaranteeing them recompense for any loss to theft, thereby neutralizing at least somewhat the fear of potential expropriation. A worker state or a social republic might use political power to insulate people against certain forms of power that the modern state, be it liberal or authoritarian, does not. I'll return to this later on, but for now I want to point out that if real freedom requires free time, this time is not free solely in virtue of being relieved of necessary labor. Being subject to dominating power means that your time is not your own. This is obviously true of the enslaved who have no free time at all, even when they have no work, since they're always at the beck and call of the slaveholder. But this is also true of women in a male-dominated society. Um, so in the US, the confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh have led people to share a gendered violence workshop activity in, on social media. Um, and in the workshop activity, the moderator asked the audience of women and men, okay, well, what do you do on a daily basis to avoid sexual assault? 
and the men are like, uh, I don't do anything. Um, and then the women start to speak and they, they list the things they do. They avoid empty parks, they walk the long way home after work, they don't stop at highway rest stops, they take self-defense courses, all so forth. A litany of time and attention consuming maneuvers and activities. In other words, and the lesson I think is that vulnerability to alien power degrades time. It eats it up with anxiety and strategies. And I think Marx is sensitive to this. Um, it's noteworthy, for instance, returning to something I've already mentioned, that he denies that the modern ruling class of capitalists enjoy free time. This class is made up of rough, half-educated parvenus, not the free persons of antiquity, because capitalists are market-dominated producers, attentive to the shifting whims of supply and demand, and anxious to accumulate lest they go under. Marx wants to turn this to the advantage of the workers' movement. Um, labor organizations should fight for higher wages, and especially shorter working days, in order that the workers themselves will have the time and resources to educate and develop themselves politically, but also so as to keep the market pressure on capitalists high. This will, Marx argues, speed both the development of productive technology as competition on productivity heats up, and the concentration of capital as less capital intensive firms go under. <clears throat> this strategy hinges on the capitalist domination by the market and consequent lack of free time. Given how Marx understands real freedom and political power, finally, um, his conception of positive freedom does not license forcing people to be free. So Marx's notion of free, real freedom is, I would say, a utopian element in his thought, but a utopian element that precludes utopianism. That is, it precludes the prescription of doctrinaire blueprints of social organization to be realized by any means necessary. The perspective of real freedom, as I've tried to reconstruct it up to this point, is that of an ethical ideal of the good life. <clears throat> it establishes a vast distance between the world as it is and the world in which, it, in which we could be satisfied. But it also tells us that the movement by which we try to change this world can never quite bring us to that other world. The political movement can only establish certain political prerequisites of real freedom. It cannot directly develop the Promethean technical prerequisites, but it can increasingly protect workers' time from the impositions of domination. So that's my first, the first leg of the argument. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's turn to self-determination. So regardless of what Marx says about real freedom, he's also held to be a proponent of self-determination in one sense or another. And this may seem to be a more properly political ideal of freedom. It seems to me that Marx invokes something like self-determination in three distinct contexts. And so what I want to do is I want to look at each of those types of self-determination in turn. The first is the notion of individual or small corporate group independence or self-determination. The second is a characterization of democracy at the level of the nation state as self-rule. And the third is the already encountered promise of collective rational control over the material production process. I'm gonna try to dispense with the first two as quickly as possible so that we can look at the third more fully. Um, as that's the version of freedom of self, as self-determination most often attributed to Marx and for good reason. So, first, um, when self-determination is discussed in contemporary political theory, it often refers to something like personal independence or autonomy, including artificial or corporate persons like churches, universities, or firms. And this same usage shows up in Marx. Often, it's marked by the terms uh, Selbstständigkeit, independence, or Selbstbestimmung, self-determination. A representative text is this passage from the first draft of Capital. Or really, it's really the third draft of capital, but whatever. Um, so over, uh, this is another block quote. Over against the independent artisan um, who works for unfamiliar customers, one observes naturally a great increase in the continuity of the laborers who work for the capitalists, whose labor is not limited by the chance needs of isolated customers, but only by the need for exploitation of the capital that employs them. 
<clears throat> Over against the slave, on the other hand, this labor is productive since it is intensive insofar as the slave labors only under the drive of external fear, but not for his existence, which does not belong to him and yet is guaranteed. The free laborer, however, is driven by his wants. The feeling, or rather the idea, Vorstellung, uh, of free self-determination, of freedom, and the feeling, Bewusstsein, of responsibility bound up with it, make this one a better worker than the other. <clears throat> he is, like any other commodity seller, responsible for the commodity which he delivers and which he must deliver of a certain quality, lest he be driven from the field by another commodity seller of the same species. So note that independence of this sort is either the attribute of artisans and peasants, petty producers, or the imagined or ideal quality of wage workers and capitalist producers. It's a concomitant of the exchange relations between people. And I think this is consistent in how Marx uses these, this terminology. The more extensive these exchange relations and the more intensive, uh, that is the more they approximate complete market dependency, the more likely Marx is to describe this independence as felt or imagined. In no case, though, is it something that Marx wants to bring about or universalize. He was harshly critical of those socialists like Proudhon who seemed to him to buy into this conception of freedom and seek only to make it universal. So in a passage from the Grundrisse, Marx gives an etiology of this uh, conception of freedom as self-determination, as, as personal autonomy or independence. He writes, <clears throat> out of the act of exchange itself, the individual, each one of them, is reflected in himself as its exclusive and dominant or determinant subject. With that then, the complete freedom of the individual is posited. Voluntary transaction, no force on either side. Equality and freedom are thus not only respected in exchange based on exchange values, but also the exchange of exchange values is the productive real basis of all equality and freedom. And pure idea, as pure ideas, they are merely the idealized expressions of this basis. As developed in juridical, political, social relations, they are merely this basis to a higher power. And so it has been in history. Equality and freedom as developed to this extent are exactly the opposite of the freedom and equality in the world of antiquity, where developed exchange value was not their basis, but where rather the development of that basis destroyed them. So this is the notion of freedom about which Marx is critically deflationary. Individual self-determination, individual autonomy is an ideological reflex of the market and a sham ideal. And it's not uh, Marx's notion. So, um, well, turn to the second conception. So while Marx is a critic of this first notion of personal self-determination, he's often held to be a proponent of self-determination in a second sense, a sense that also occurs both in his text and with great frequency in contemporary political theory. This is self-determination as an alias for political democracy. Democracy as collective self-rule or popular sovereignty. It's hard to find anyone writing in the wake of the French Revolution who does not talk about democracy in these terms, and Marx is no exception. However, Marx's political advocacy of democracy, uh, at least after his conversion to socialism in 1844, harkens back instead to the original conception of democracy, I think, as literally the power, the kratos, of the mass of people in assembly, the demos rather than reiterating the modern assertion that the whole, rather than a part or an other, is politically sovereign. That this is the original meaning of democracy is controversial, of course. Um, no less an authority on ancient Greek political thought than Josiah Ober argues that democratia means rule by all of the people, and therefore the self-rule of the entire citizen body. However, I am thoroughly convinced by two sources that this construction is incorrect. Um, and we know that one of these sources had special authority for Marx. So invoke Aristotle for a third time. Uh, Aristotle always interprets democracy as the rule of the many, which everywhere means the rule of the poor. And say what you will about Aristotle's political allegiances, I think he was a keen student of political matters and I'm inclined to trust him on this one. Um, 
Second, um, Daniela Kamek, in an essay that's forthcoming in Classical Quarterly, has exhausted it, but it's available online. You can look it up. Um, it, she's exhaustively examined the uses of demos in the ancient sources. Uh, and she demonstrates that, <clears throat> I'll read a chunk of her argument. Quote, the original meaning of demos, and that implied in Democratia, was assembly, defined as the collective political agent constituted by the common people in explicit contradistinction from those who played leading political roles, such as princes, counselors, elders, generals, or orators, including orators in regimes where everyone who wished might speak publicly, such as democratic Athens. Demos did not indicate anyone who attended an assembly meeting, that is to say, but specifically the audience, those who listened, responded, and otherwise acted en masse, as opposed to those who spoke pu publicly or performed other individual political actions. By extension, demos denoted all those who participated in politics through collective action in explicit contradistinction from those who had personal political significance, close quote. In other words, the birth of democracy was neither the birth of collective self-rule nor the birth of popular sovereignty. Rather, it was the ascendancy of the assembled people's decision-making power over the power of those who called them together, addressed them, and held offices while they were dispersed. <clears throat> this power of the assembled people was not the rule of all, but as Aristotle insisted, the rule of the many, those who are of necessity multitudinous. This power was collective, but it was not self-rule, since it was first and foremost power over the local elites, those who stood out from the crowd and made a name for themselves. The question was whether those elites could take decisions on their own and commit the city to policies and courses of action, or whether they had to seek the approval of the assembly. <clears throat> was the assembly a robust check on elite decision-making power or not? How much control did the assembly have over elite action? This accords very well with Marx's claim that winning the battle of democracy would mean the organized and class conscious proletariat leading the masses in suppressing the power of the capitalists and landed proprietors. In other words, Marx advocated democracy precisely because it was not collective self-rule, but rather the political rule of the many poor over the few with economic or official sources of power. Marx's commitment to democracy as popular power over elites goes beyond his support of workers' political mobilization against the capitalist state, too. <clears throat> In his arguments with Bakunin and his encomium to the Paris Commune, he upheld democratic elections as an essential instrument for checking and controlling the managerial, administrative, and legislative offices uh, of officials of socialist polities and cooperative factories alike. In short, I think, Marx was a thoroughgoing Democrat precisely because democracy is not collective self-determination. So set aside those two versions of self-determination. The most distinctively Marxian conception of self-determination, however, <clears throat> refers neither to the independent person nor to the democratic state, but pertains instead to the collective labor process. We've already encountered a couple of Marx's formulations of this notion of collective self-determination. In volume three of Capital, he refers to, quote, socialized man, the associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control, instead of being ruled by it as by the blind forces of nature, close quote. And in volume one, <clears throat> we have seen his claim that the metabolism between humans and the earth must be given quote, a systematic restoration as a regulating law of social production and under a form adequate to full human development. But what I want to do is I want to look closely at one of the more famous invocations of this notion of uh, collective rational control of the production process from Marx's discussion of the fetishism of the commodity in chapter one. And this is the law, last long block quote, I promise. Um, <clears throat> The religious reflections of the actual world can, in general, vanish only when the relations of practical workaday life present themselves to humans, day to day, as transparent, rational relations among themselves and with nature. The shape of the social life process, that is, of the material production process, 
only strips off its mystical haze when it becomes the product of freely associated human beings standing under their conscious methodical control, close quote. I think there's a lot to unpack in that passage. Um, and I want to spend the rest of the paper basically doing that. Um, so first, there's Marx's stated desire that relations among people and between people and nature be transparent and rational. There's no great mystery in his belief that the development of natural sciences and its application in technology render the relations between humans and nature transparent and rational. I take it that's pretty straightforward. Um, it's less obvious what transparent and rational relations among human beings might be, um, and what they might amount to. But the second sentence claims that transparent and rational relations among humans will be the consequence of the material production process coming under the conscious and methodical control or the mastery of freely associated people. The whole passage seems to rest on the assumption that social life can, in some sense, be treated as a product of common labor and produced cooperatively, just as a car or a house might be produced cooperatively. Right? This is the technological conception of society that Marx's critics, be they Habermas or Arendt or Hayek or Heidegger, um, react so vehemently against. However, I think a, for a few considerations can blunt the force of this negative reaction. Um, first of all, I want to Control, I think we, can, we have to focus on control. I think it's actually a multivalent word. I want to rehabilitate control to some extent. Um, so we cannot control the weather, for instance, if by control we understand the intentional causal production of the weather we want. But we can, to a much greater control, a greater extent, control the weather's impact so as to minimize the severity and extent of the weather's harmful effects on human beings and on non-human systems that we value. And incidentally, this is very close to the original meaning of control, which derives from contra rotulus, a duplicate ledger used for checking financial accounts. An umbrella is a check on the power of the rain to ruin my suit, and it controls the rain in this sense. We exercise this same sort of control over social relations all the time. Uh, this is the aim of political power and policy generally. It does not and cannot control people in the way that radio signals control a child's toy car, but it does attempt to control for people, right? To control the sorts of effects that we can have on one another. For example, we cannot control the fact that people die. Uh, but we can control, to some great extent, whether people die in workplace accidents or from intimate partner to violence. We can control these things because we can both sanction unsafe employers and violent or abusive partners, and we can empower people to avoid and leave unsafe jobs and unsafe partners. We cannot control the fact that a person's death will grieve those close to them, but we can control whether the death of a parent or spouse will cause people to fear for their own livelihood or future. In this way, conscious methodical control over social life is just what policy is, be it ever so liberal. Therefore, actually, what is, what is really distinctive about Marx's aspiration in this passage is not the desire for conscious methodical control over social life, I don't think. I think that's broadly shared by everybody who thinks that policy is important. But rather, two other claims that are embedded in this, in this passage. First of all, the claim that if freely associated people exercise conscious methodical control over the material production process, this will result in transparent and rational relations among themselves. That's the first. And second, the further claim that this outcome will lead to the dissipation of religious superstition in society. I'm much more skeptical of the second claim than Marx was, um, but nothing hangs on that for present purposes. And I think actually we can even leave aside in the first claim Marx's contention that there's something fundamental about the material production process. Marx has an argument for this claim, um, and it would be relevant for an overall consideration of Marx's position but it's superfluous from the perspective of his claims about the likely benefits of exercising conscious methodical control 
in general. What is central, however, is Marx's assertion that the transparency and rationality of social relations is contingent upon them being consciously and methodically controlled by freely associated people. And that's what I want to zero in on. How are we to understand Marx's use of free in this context? What makes people free in their association with one another? Free cannot, notice, it cannot here refer to Marx's real freedom. Right? We've already seen that the rational control of production is a prerequisite for real freedom on Marx's account. So real freedom cannot very well be part and parcel of its own prerequisite. Right? The lexical priority of collective rational control over real freedom rules this out. But likewise, free cannot here mean self-determining in Marx's sense of exercising collective rational control. Free association is the condition for collective rational control obtaining and having its desired results. Therefore, when Marx invokes freely associated people, he cannot be using free in either of the positive, the two positive senses that we can attribute to him. Okay. So we must have another notion of freedom besides those two positive senses. So what is this other notion? Right. Does he mean voluntary or non-coerced? Uh, that's doubtful. Um, remember <clears throat> that Marx associates freedom as voluntary interaction with no force on either side, um, with the market and its spontaneous ideology. Right. Thinking that association might be voluntary is the error made by Proudhon and others who tried to build socialism as the realization of the na native ideals of capitalism itself. Right? Um, voluntary society is a fiction as far as Marx is concerned. It has meaning only in the context of market relations. I think therefore that the only plausible candidate for Marx's notion of free association is something like the Republican conception of freedom from domination. Marx's free association evokes the free city of Republican thought, an association of people insulated from dominating power who cooperate in ordering their social and natural world. Moreover, I think this makes sense. It makes sense of the other mystery here. It makes sense to call the relations among such free associates transparent and rational. Right? and to claim that their social life stands under their conscious methodical control. None of them can be affected in anything that is of great import to them, life, health, family, friendship ties, without having a say in that matter. Hence, each one is a check on or controls whatever power might affect their important interests. This power of each, combined and severally, to control the powers that are above them is known to each and to all of them. That's transparency. And this entails that all policy must be justified to those it impacts, hence rationality. So that's my, there, there's the republicanism. Um, if this is persuasive, then a nice symmetry emerges. Marx hopes that in a communist future, everyone might enjoy two forms of positive liberty. One, the real freedom to develop their powers and capacities in an open-ended way. And two, the necessary freedom to exercise common control over the production process. Both of these positive powers, it turns out, require the negative freedom of non-domination. Real freedom requires free time, which must be free both of necessity and of domination. And collective self-determination, freedom in necessity, requires scientifically advanced production technology overseen by an association of people free from domination. Thus, a Republican conception of negative freedom, freedom from domination, is constitutive of both realms of positive freedom. So to reiterate what I want the takeaways to be. First of all, <clears throat> um, Marx's conception of real freedom is, I think, utopian and ethical, and therefore, plays no real role in either his critique of capitalism or his properly political thought. 
Second, the evidence indicates that Marx's advocacy of collective rational control over the production process is compatible with and presupposes a conception of political freedom as non-domination. And given these results, I want to urge, the Republican reading of Marx is especially worth pursuing because it's attractive for independent reasons. Our technical capacity to administer and regulate the natural world is not lacking. Um, the, limitations of the, work, the limitation of the working day could be pursued quite radically given existing production technology. What is sorely lacking is our social power to protect one another from concentrated power, including the concentrated power to administer and regulate the natural world. I think Marx is an important resource for thinking about both the forces that sustain this lack of equitable social power and the forces that could overcome it, but we cannot avail ourselves of this resource so long as we think he offers only or primarily an account of positive freedom. Thank you.